Hello, let me introduce myself. I am Alan, your guide for today. This audio guide has been put together to give you a taste of the history of Chelmsford and its association with the early days of the Marconi Company. Tour will last around 60 minutes and take you from the starting point here in Hall Street via the High Street to a finishing point in New Street at the junction with Dunn Side. At each location there will be a narration. At the end of this I will ask you to stop the recording and restart it once you reach the next location. You should now be at the starting point which is outside the Woolpack Public House at the junction of Hall Street and Mildmay Road. This walk will take us on a trip back into the past to a time when Marconi was one of the biggest employers in Chelmsford. In those days, the most common way to travel around the town was by bicycle. And so we start here in Hall Street. Back in the mid-1890s, Girolamo Marconi was in his mid-twenties living in Italy near Bologna. He had a keen interest in the new science of wireless telegraph. He had read all the material on the subject he could find. With this knowledge, he started to build equipment and experimented with sending basic Morse code messages to his brother in the next village. He soon realised that this message system would be very useful to the Italian Navy, but when he showed it to them, they showed little interest. His Irish mother, Annie Jamieson, of the famous Whiskey Company, suggested that they should journey to London, because at the time, Britain was the world's supreme maritime nation. And so in 1896 they arrived in London together with some of Mr Marconi's equipment that he had been using for his experiments. William Priest was then the chief engineer of the General Post Office and he saw great potential in this young Italian and his ideas. He assigned one of his key men, George Kemp, to work with Marconi was a short man with red curly hair and a handlebar moustache. The two men got on well from the start and soon Kemp and Marconi developed a good working relationship. The GPO was then a very powerful organisation and could see a great future in the new wireless technology. By 1897 Mr Marconi had developed the radio system to send long distance messages. He ran successful experiments sending radio signals first across Salisbury Plain and then the Bristol Channel. By then he was travelling around the country demonstrating his new wireless equipment. The contacts he made on these trips generated some financial backing for Mr Marconi and later that year he was able to move away from William Priest and the support from the GPO. He formed Marconi's Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company Limited and took George Kemp with him. Kemp became a very close friend and later in life he went on to advise Mr Marconi even on the best diet. In December 1898 Mr Marconi's advisers were looking for a property in this area and they came across this old silk mill then owned by Mr W.G. Wenley and Son. Very soon they took out a lease for 25 years along with the Alfred Cottage next door. This later became the residence of the on-site caretaker, John Reeve. The old silk mill then became the first wireless factory in the world. Why choose Chelmsford? Well, the countryside around was mostly flat and it was in easy reach of London by the railway. There was also the electrical industry of the great Colonel Crompton, already here in Chelmsford, as well as the industrial engineer, Bell Christie. Another reason for moving here may have been that there was no tram network in Chelmsford and so no aerial electrical interference to worry about. In 1898 at Hall Street the layout of the new wireless factory was with a machine shop on the ground floor with an overhead belt system to drive the various lathes and drills. Upstairs was divided off into a number of rooms including a research laboratory and three rooms dedicated to the manufacture of electrical coils. Initially there were 20 men and two boys employed on on the site but soon this increased to 55 roughly split between men on the ground floor and women on the first floor. 
From 1900 onwards, small spark gap wireless sets were made here mainly for the use at sea. Mr Marconi was a great salesman and after loaning three of these sets to the Royal Navy they became one of his biggest customers. This soon prompted other owners of ships to follow suit including merchant ships. In 1903 radio equipment made at this factory helped Mr Marconi to make the first transatlantic radio broadcast when he sent a Morse code message from Cornwall to Newfoundland. This signal was the first step towards the commercial transatlantic wireless service of 1908. Research in those days was carried out at experimental stations at Paul Harbour and in Broomfield on Fell Christie's site, just north of Chelmsford, Dalston. With the expansion of the business, manufacturing was in 1905 transferred to Dalston in East London, but eventually, due to poor management, in 1908, the factory was moved back here to Hall Street. Godfrey Isaacs When Mr Marconi took over as stand-in site manager, business was slow. However, in January 1910, he appointed a man to join him as joint site manager. His name was Godfrey Isaacs. Once he was given complete control in August of that year, operations improved and the production soon spread across Hall Street. This was a plot of land opposite Alfred Cottage, where a 210 foot steel mast aerial was erected. By then double day shifts were being worked in the factory to make wireless equipment to export all over the world. All the great Atlantic passenger liners were then fitted with radios sets leased from the Marconi company. This included the Lusitania, the Mauritania, the Baltic, the Olympic, the Britannic and the ill-fated Titanic. To ensure these sets were operated correctly, Mr Marconi insisted that as part of the lease of the radio equipment, only his trained operators were allowed to use it. So all the radio operators at the time were employees of the Marconi Wireless Company. RMS Titanic A complete radio system made in Hall Street was installed on the Titanic before she sailed on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic. The messages used were Marconigrams, a commercial venture charged at five pence per word. On the night of 15th April 1912, the RMS Titanic collided with an iceberg and eventually sank. There were two radio operators on board that night, Harold Bride and Jack Phillips. Both trained Marconi men. Jack was on duty at the time and he was soon joined by Harold. Together they continued to tap out the distress message even as the ship was going down. First they broadcast CQD, CQ or stations, D distress. And then at the captain's suggestion, they then broadcast SOS in the hope that someone would hear them. When the boat sank, both men made it independently to the same upturned collapsible lifeboat. But only Harold the junior officer survived the extreme cold conditions. When he was rescued by the SS Carpathia, he was barely conscious. But when he came round, he asked to be taken to the ship's radio room. Even though he was then suffering from severe frostbite in his legs and his feet, he continued with the other operator to send out broadcasts for another 18 hours. In June 1912, at the Court of Inquiry into the loss, the judge stated that those over 700 people that had been saved had been saved through one man, Mr Marconi and his marvellous invention. Ironically, Marconi had been offered a free passage on the RMS Titanic before she sailed. But instead, he had taken the Lusitania three days earlier. He had left from Liverpool to New York to attend an important business meeting. 
involving the American side of the Marconi Company. Eventually, in the summer of 1912, even more space was required at Hall Street for the company, and so Godfrey Isaacs instigated the company's relocation to the New Street site. Research, however, continued in the huts across Hall Street under the tall mast. Two days before the outbreak of the First World War, a man called Morris Wright was experimenting with a new device hooked up to that radio mast. He picked up some long-distance German naval Morse radio signals and these were then passed on to the British Admiralty. From this one incident, a whole network of secret listening Y stations grew. These were open wireless Morse traffic and it was not until after the war that radio ciphers and codes were used for the first time. The old factory was used for research for some time until 1923 when the lease ran out. It then reverted to its earlier function as a furniture store but this time under the ownership of Pickfords. More recently it became the offices of the Essex Water Company. Today the building has been completely converted into apartments however it still bears two commemorative blue plaques one to the radio factory and the other to Sir Robert Telford. Before we progress on to our next location it may be worth just taking a look at the information board on the wall of the Woolpack Public House which features some of the people that once worked in this famous factory. Our next location will be Barrack Square in front of the large black and white photographs on the side wall of the co-op building. The suggested route is to continue down Mildmay Road and out onto Parkway, taking care then to cross the road by the underpass, if you wish, into the High Street. Barrack Square can then be found on the first road on the left and please stop the recording now and restart it again once you have reached that location. Thank you. We are now in Barrack Square and looking at the large black and white photographs on the wall of the co-op. We see in the middle photograph the old Regent's Theatre built in 1913 as a theatre but just three years later in August 1916 it became a cinema with a seating capacity of over a thousand people. It was also used by the Chelmsford Amateur and Operatic Society. This quite probably was the place where a number of Marconi employees would have spent their Saturday nights at the Flicks. Beside the bridge was the Cock Inn, a small block-like building. This was demolished around 1890 to make way for the Gothic style Wesleyan Methodist Church whose foundation stone was laid in 1897. He had a seating for 800 people and a large schoolroom at the back. In the 1950s it was realised that the great church was sinking into the river and so it was eventually demolished. This could have been where some of the Marconi employees attended church on a Sunday morning. Our next location will be at the top of the High Street, outside the front of the Saracen's Head Hotel. The suggested route is to walk towards and over the Stone Bridge, then follow the High Street to the top of the hill and the Grand Shire Hall. Please stop the recording now and restart it again once you have reached that location. Thank you. The Saracen's Head Hotel. We have now come up the high street and are standing outside the Saracen's Head Hotel. First built in 1539 and then rebuilt in 1724. This was once a coaching inn and the evidence being the courage arch still there to this day. Signor Giuliano Marconi only stayed in the very best hotels and he must have liked the Saracen's Head because this was his Chelmsford residence when he visited 
the factory in New Street. Mr Marconi's association with this building has now prompted the installation of a special blue plaque, which we can see on the outside of the building. This was made possible by the hard work of the Chelmsford Civic Society. During the Second World War, the Saracen's Head opened its doors to the American Red Cross and it became a Red Cross hostel. This fact has prompted the new owner to rename the building the Garrison. If we now turn to our left, we see Shire Hall, which was designed by John Johnson and built in 1791, using the same stone as the stone bridge, again with code stone decorations. These are the cream coloured stone you can see in front of you. Mr Marconi's association with this building goes back to November 1900 when there was an exhibition of Essex manufacturers that took place in Shire Hall. Mr Marconi being the showman hired the ballroom and installed working, receiving and transmitting radio equipment in the room. During the exhibition assistants in white coats were seen sending and receiving wireless messages across the room. The visitors could witness at first hand this intensely interesting new invention in action. Our next location will be in New Street, just before the railway bridge. The suggested route is to go round the left side of Shire Hall into the Cathedral Gardens. Following the path with the window end of the cathedral on your left, you will eventually emerge into New Street. Remaining on this side of the road, follow this road eventually crossing Victoria Road towards the railway bridge. Please stop the recording now and restart it again once you reach the next location. Thank you. We are now in front of the railway bridge. Right up until the late 1950s, shift changes at Marconi's and at Hoffman's resulted in massive traffic congestion in and around New Street. These were mainly bicycles with the occasional bus. The restriction to this traffic was the railway bridge, which was replaced with a wider structure eventually in 1962. Just on the other side of the bridge, the area to the right was once a goods yard with cattle pens and was part of the railway, linked to the main line via a steep embankment. This siding originally served Marriage's Flour Mill and later the Hoffman's Ball Bearing Company. When the New Street factory was built, the siding was extended across New Street into the factory. A level crossing can be seen in some of the old photographs that are now available in the Chelmsford Museum. Our next location will be further along New Street on the same side of the road, before the junction with Brook Street. To your left will then be the entrance to the former Marconi 1912 building through a pair of low black wrought iron gates. Please stop the recording now and restart it once you reach that next location. Thank you. We are now outside the grand front door of the 1912 building which has a white plinth over the door and the words Marconi written in gold lettering above. In 1911, the company was expanding so fast that the Hall Street site was no longer big enough. Godfrey Isaacs, the then managing director, proposed the world's first purpose-designed and purpose-built wireless factory in the world. Marconi and Isaacs' vision was for a radio manufacturing city which was completely self-sufficient with raw materials coming in by railway trucks across the road and right into the factory and the finishing goods then travelling out in the opposite direction. The town's former cricket ground in New Street, owned by the church, was purchased by the company in January 1912 and within an astounding 17 weeks, including one week for a strike, a huge workforce of 500 contract 
bricklayers constructed the world's first purpose-built radio factory. The reason for the urgency in completing the factory was to coincide with an international radio conference to be held in London. This was a chance for Mr Marconi to showcase his new factory. And so on the 22nd of June 1912, the delegates were brought from London on a special train and their tour of the New Street factory started just inside the large front door that you see in front of you. To ensure the new employees had somewhere to live nearby, two roads with houses were constructed by the Marconi Company. These were given the names of Bishop Road and Marconi Road. Both these roads can be seen on the left further up New Street towards the new university. The new Marconi site at New Street was 70,000 square feet, whereas Hall Street was 4,000 square feet. To minimise disruption, the entire move from Hall Street to the new site was carried out over a weekend. This main building housed the offices and the showrooms for the site. Upstairs there was a drawing office at the far end and at the other end was the senior management dining room. We will now move on to our last location and that is behind the 1912 building. Please can you therefore walk along to the end of the building and then take the next road on the left which is done side. Proceed along this road, past the co-op shop and into the large area behind the 1912 building. Please stop the recording now and restart it once you have reached that next destination. We are now standing in a large open car parking area which is surrounded by housing. As there will from time to time be cars manoeuvring in this space, please be aware of this and move aside if required. Soon after the main building was completed in 1912, large, low factory buildings and sheds appeared where you are standing now. In 1920, speech and entertainment over the wireless, or radio, was very much in its infancy. Some of the engineers based at New Street were keen to experiment with the new communication medium. As an experiment, they were permitted to carry out regular 30-minute broadcasts. The clever man responsible for these was Mr W.T. Ditcham. Initially, these broadcasts were just speech, like reading railway timetables, and then the newspaper, which was greeted with much pleasure. This reaction started the engineers thinking of more uses of this new medium. They soon started playing gramophone records, and the equipment seemed to cope well, and so they moved on to the next step, live musical performances. At that time, there was a young lady who was a part-time amateur soprano, and she was working in the offices at the nearby Hoffman Ball Bearing Company. Her name was Miss Winifred Sayer. One of the Marconi engineers, Edward Cooper, invited Winifred to come and sing for them into their wireless equipment. Because of this invitation, Winifred became Britain's first paid radio artiste. So in spring 1920, for three nights, she was paid the handsome nightly sum of 10 shillings, that's 20 pound in today's money, to sing for 30 minutes in a converted packing shed on the Marconi New Street site. The location was somewhere near Marconi Road. The acoustics in the shed were terrible and the microphone equipment she was asked to sing into was made up of a part of a telephone receiver mouthpiece and a wood surround made from an old cigar box. This crude microphone was connected to a powerful transmitter which was humming away not far from her. In fact you could see it glowing blue on the other side of the room. Outside the transmitter cable was coupled to a long aerial wire suspended between two 450 foot high masts. These at the time could be seen right the way across Chelmsford. There was no backing music, so she kept her song short, with only a tuning fork to start her in the right key. 
After one of these sessions, she was told by Godfrey Isaacs that she had helped to make history. Winifred at the time was unimpressed, but later she was to learn that her voice could be heard as far away as Norway. In June 1920, a more famous broadcast was made by Dame Nellie Melba, using virtually the same equipment, but Winifred was first. However, history seems to have forgotten her and her great voice. However, the Chelmsford Civic Society are now working on the request for a blue plaque to honour this great woman and the part she played in radio history. Working with the Daily Mail newspaper, the Marconi Publicity Department arranged to persuade a famous Australian opera singer, Dame Lely Melba, to come to Chelmsford and sing into the equipment tested by Winifred. The deal was finally sealed when a fee of a thousand pounds was offered. On the 15th of June 1920, Dame Nelly arrived on a special train from London and was brought to the New Street site. After a light meal, she was taken across the yard to a hastily prepared studio. When Dame Nelly Melba was informed by one of the technicians that her voice was going to emanate from those large masts, she was heard to say, Young man, if you think I'm going all the way up there, you're very much mistaken. This event was the first official publicised sound broadcast in the UK. The result was a signal that could be heard as far away as Berlin and Madrid. How far did it go? Well, there was something picked up in Australia, but it was very difficult to hear it clearly through all the static. Through careful research, we have now managed to pinpoint the exact location of where that first radio studio was located. It's on the corner of Marconi Road and Dunside. From those early days of Morse code and then speech radio, the company continued to expand into many different product ranges, including radar and communications which served the country well in those dark days of World War II. After the war, the company came into its heyday, and the area where you are now standing became a massive production floor where a whole range of devices were made. These included not only television transmitters, but also studio equipment and cameras. Today, the only remnants of that large production building is a cream painted wall on the far side of the car park. If you look closely, you can see a steel girder that was once used to move large pieces of equipment. Next to the wall, there is a tall building, which at one time served as a water tower and was a key part of the fire sprinkler system. Of course, the site also had its own fire brigade who swung into action whenever needed. Although over recent years the name of the Marconi Company has disappeared from Chelmsford, the legacy lives on. The location? The site in Waterhouse Lane on what was once a secret World War II radar factory and later became known as the English Electric Valve Company or EEV and then E2V. Coming right up to date, the company is now called Teledyne E2V and a major part of the production there is now high quality imaging cameras used in space exploration. They still make radar components. However, these are also now used in body scanners for medical purposes. In conclusion, when the young Mr. Marconi used radio wave for practical signaling without wires in 1896, he led us into the era of practical electronics, including not only radio, but television, radar and space communication. It may be claimed that Marconi's choice of a disused warehouse in Hall Street to be the birthplace of the world's radio industry makes Chelmsford the starting point of the electronic age. Could it be that because of his many talents, we now have microprocessors, powerful computers, mobile communications and wireless networks. We should therefore be very proud of our Marconi heritage and celebrate it. 
We are now coming to the end of this recording today, but if you would like to know more about the Marconi Company, there are walks coming soon, organised by Chelmsford History Walks and Talks. Their website can be found on Google. In the meantime, there are more local Heritage Open Days events happening until the 20th of September. Details of these can be found on the Chelmsford Civic Society website. This is the end of our recording today, and thank you for listening. For now, this is Alan Pamphilon, signing off, and thank you.